Hi, I'm DJ Ware. Welcome to another edition of the Cyber Gizmo. Today we're going to be talking about virtual machines and containers right after this. So let's start from the beginning of uh, the the uh, good old days. <laughs> no, they weren't the good old days. They were. This is just what we had to work with. Um, the problem was uh, back when I started, the hardware was very expensive, and uh, you couldn't afford to uh, <laughs> to have a whole lot of it. So you were kind of stuck if you wanted to run a bunch of applications on on uh, on your computers. You had one, <laughs> and that's about it. So you crammed as much as you could onto it and hoped for the best. So the, uh, I, I mean, we, we all have seen this, right? I mean, even if we're just deploying Linux, we, we deploy our libraries, we deploy our bins, and then we put some applications on it that we want to use. And then we find that the interactions between the libraries put us in library hell. And so we end up with, uh, <laughs> we find that, hey, this application isn't working. We talk to the devs. They say, well, it's working on my machine. I don't know what your problem is. Uh, maybe you didn't read the manual. Uh, but <laughs> I don't know how many times I've heard that. I wish I had a dollar for every time that someone told me it works on my machine. I would have retired 20 years ago. But let's look at what some of those things are. Now, we talked a little bit about the library differences already, so I won't cover those again. But it takes a lot of time to set up an environment where you have application stacks and library stacks, uh, and, and it takes a lot to maintain it. You have to be, you either have to spend a lot of time retesting every time you've upgraded a library because chances are you're going to break an app, or you're going to find a mismatch between the libraries and what the app requires. Something in the API has changed, and maybe you've got a new variable that's showing up on a system call or on an app call. But the other problem was that uh, uh, because the hardware was so expensive, it also took a very long time to receive anything new. So if you needed a memory upgrade or you needed a disk upgrade, you waited months in order to get it. Uh, and so a lot of times the hardware was oversized. You, you, you made sure you had the hardware you needed in an expected uh, demand uh, and tried to predict that the demand was going to increase. A lot of times we would do hardware studies for out to five years because that was about the uh, lifetime of those machines. And so uh, they were based on the expected peaks and not on reality. <laughs> Maybe they weren't based on reality at all. So many times the servers just simply went underutilized. Well, that's a shame because you have all that hardware sitting there and then you're not using all of it. The other problem was that security was coarse grain. I mean, you could, sure, you could apply some security parameters to the applications, but they had to be generalized because if I set my application security too tight, I might break an app uh, because it wasn't, you know, it's, it needed something open that I closed or I exposed a vulnerability in another app. So it wasn't a really good situation. And so you had to kind of strike a middle ground versus really being able to tune the security the way you wanted to. Uh, in uh, 1965, so virtual machines have been around a long time. Uh, IBM was attempting to measure the effectiveness of some new ideas in computer science, and they just simply needed a way to roll back to the old version uh, of the machine before they applied those changes to see what differences that, that, it, that a particular new idea made. And so they created a, a concept of virtual machines, which allowed them to roll back easily and then put on their changes and roll it forward. That resulted in a commercial product, which was released in 1972, and that was VM370. And that was the first commercial, commercial virtual machine uh, uh, operating system. IBM, of course, still manufactures mainframes to this day, and they all have some form of virtual machine uh, operating system on them. Uh, I don't think it's called VM370 anymore. Uh, today, however, in the uh, Linux and Mac and Windows world, we have many choices that we can use in order to uh, deploy virtual machines, both at home and in production environments. So let's take a look at a little bit about uh, some of the things that are common to all of the virtual machines. There are two types. There's a type one 
And before we really talk about the differences, let's talk about the similarities and let's start with the hardware. So back around the early uh, part of the 21st century, both Intel and AMD added hardware extensions to their processors to support virtualization. And this, at first, did not increase performance of virtual machines because they didn't take advantage of the hardware, but later on they did, and we started seeing tremendous increases in performance in, in virtual machines because the hardware layer was able to support it better. So the type one, you have a hypervisor, and a hypervisor is basically an intermediary uh, between the virtual machine and the hardware. Uh, it has a, a number of classes of devices and monitors and things that, to create virtual machines built in it. Um, and, and so a, a type two, you deploy your, your, your hypervisor on top of the host OS, whereas the type one, you deploy the hypervisor directly on top of the hardware. Now the hypervisor does have a operating system of sorts Otherwise, it wouldn't be able to allocate memory and assign devices and so forth to the virtual machines. You have to have something there to manage that. Uh, some examples of Type 1, uh, Centrix Zen, KVM, Microsoft Hyper-V, VMware ESXi, or, or it's called vSphere now, but uh, underneath the covers, it's still ESXi. Also, XCPNG, uh, which is the open source version of Zen. On the Type 2 side, we have or things like Oracle VirtualBox and Parallels Desktop and Parallels Workstation. QEMU, which also can be installed as a Type 1 if it's installed under KVM. Uh, you have uh, VMware's Fusion uh, for uh, Mac and VMware Workstation for Windows, which also allow you to do those things as well. But the, the, the basic idea is the same between the uh, virtual machines. Uh, you have a, a VM, you have some kind of guest OS that your app needs in order to support its uh, execution, and then you have some uh, libraries or device drivers or things that are particular to your machine that you have to create. Now, those have to be installed, so you're, you're going to need some kind of configuration management tool to do that. It might be Jenkins, it might be Ansible, it might be... Uh, any of the other hosts of configuration management tools that are out there uh, in order to manage that. But once you've got that VM built, you can, you know, take it and create a template out of it. And we'll talk about that. And, on, and, and uh, you just create those applications as virtual machines and deploy them. They can be uh, monolithic. That is, you might have just one application stack inside of there uh, because it's very easy to have virtual machines communicate with each other. Particularly if they're on the same machine, they'll, they'll, they'll communicate at, at, uh, at very high speeds because they don't have to go back out and hit a network, uh, a physical network, in order to do their communication. So virtual machines uh, over the traditional environment obviously offers more isolation than you would have uh, in applications just running on the same box. Uh, a VM can be easily moved, whether that be moved from one machine to another, whether it be... Uh, move to uh, a, a whole new data center uh, because virtual, virtual machine, most of the management software has the concepts of virtual of, uh, data centers and also hosts. Uh, and so, or you can have it automatically move based on whether or not the, a particular resource is underutilized. The deployment can be done via VM templates, which is just a kind of a snapshot of, uh, of the uh, virtual machine. So once you have it configured the way you want it, you can then create a template and deploy it as many times as you need to. So, and security can be set inside the VM. So uh, your applications can have a set of security parameters that are needed for that particular application without uh, negatively impacting an application running inside another VM. But one of the downsides that you always hear and, and, uh, is that a VM has a larger footprint because it has a traditional guest OS inside the virtual machine. Um, we'll, we'll see if that's really a disadvantage or not. Containers uh, came about uh, a little bit later. Uh, Bell Labs introduced the, the Chirrut uh, uh, concept inside of uh, the Bell Labs Unix uh, version 7 which offered some level of protection. If, uh, um, if you've installed Arch, you've done Chirrut. 
uh, you, you kind of know a little bit about that. What it basically does is it repositions the root directory to any arbitrary directory that you've assigned to it. So uh, applications that are running inside of a Cheroot can't access anything outside of their top level directory. It's just they're not physically able to move above that level. BSD jails introduced a clear cut separation. Uh, uh, they have uh, a concept of an IP address for each one of the jails. So those machines actually do have a very good separation between services. Uh, if you've run PFSense, you're running under jails. Uh, Solaris containers came around about four years later and, and they, uh, Solaris added some additional system resource controls and boundary protection. Uh, they also added uh, snapshots and ZFS uh, came around that same time. Uh, LXC is an implementation that actually started out in vLinux. Uh, and I, I don't think they're active anymore. Uh, but they, uh, that actually took containers uh, off of the BSD systems and ported them to uh, Linux. So LXC was one of the first imp uh, complete implementations of a container on Linux. Uh, Let Me Contain That For You was a, uh, a version of the Google Container Stack uh, they ceased development and then this group took it over uh, uh, in order to uh, continue the code base as live container. And Docker uh, originally was uh, implemented on type of LXC and then they wanted better control, better performance, so they uh, invented a version of live container of their own called Run C. Now I don't know if they actually uh, implemented off of uh, LMC TFY or not. I, I suspect they probably did, but I don't know that for sure. I don't work for uh, Docker, so I don't know. Um, Rocket uh, is a relatively new one, or RKT, it, it's pronounced Rocket. Uh, that actually incorporates a, a, a VM as part of the container, so you get better isolation. Uh, and that is the basis of core OS uh, going forward. That that is the way uh, containers will work. They're called pods. Uh, Docker has donated their uh, container D to the CNCF, which is the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. And so that has now be been entered into the open source as the Mobi project. Um, containers have uh, kind of a traditional look a little bit. Uh, they have a host hardware, they have a host OS, and then you have the Docker engine, which runs uh, in between the host OS and the containers. So it's basically a service uh, that's running there and managing the containers and the build outs and the runs and, and the stops and so forth. Uh, a container just contains the application, the binaries and the libraries needed to deploy. Um, it can de You can deploy an operating system with containers. Uh, there's a number of them that are out in the uh, Docker Hub, which is the registry where you can pull containers in to install. Uh, and so you uh, you have that, but uh, the, so the, even though they're kind of similar to virtual machines, they're a little bit more relaxed as, uh, as far as the isolation properties. Um, you still have to build up the container. I mean, you still have to somebody has to go through the effort of putting the libraries together and testing it and making sure that you have the applications all hooked in correctly, have the right versions. But once you've done that, you can then share that container with others and it'll run just like it did on your machine. So no more of that, well, it works on my machine because if it does work on your machine, it'll work on your other user's machine that you're sharing with as well. The other thing is it doesn't matter where you deploy it to. You can deploy that container to a build environment, a test environment, a production environment. You can deploy it to uh, Amazon Web Services. You can deploy it to Azure. You can put it on your own cloud. You can even put it on Windows, you can put it on a Mac, you can put it on, a, on a, uh, a laptop, and it will run exactly the way it was intended to run by the developer. The other thing is, uh, you'll hear a lot about with containers is that it enables microservices. Well, uh, well, good luck with that, because uh, <laughs> that's, that's just another fine-grained version of messaging. And messaging has not been successful in, in any environment that I've ever seen it in. It started out in mock. It was a dismal failure because it couldn't perform. Uh, they, moved, uh, they moved it up a level. They added more capabilities to it. And they made it SOA. 
or uh, no, never mind. I won't tell you that the acronym that we actually call it. Uh, but uh, uh, but so it was a failure. It just wouldn't perform. I suspect microservices will be the same, the same failure. And the problem is, is it moves the workload to the network. That's the slowest piece in the architecture of any computer system. So um, if they don't, if microservices is not addressing the performance issue of the network by moving it somewhere else, then they're not fixing the problem and it'll, it's doomed to fail just like the other two were. My opinion. Um, I'm currently involved in a, in a, uh, in a, I'm looking at moving my, at least some or all or part of my 12 virtual machines. I currently run them on XCP and G, which is uh, version eight. I have two hosts that are hosting those uh, 12 virtual machines right now. I'm looking to, uh, to move part or all of them to a container base. So I'm looking at Docker, looking at Rocket, looking at container, uh, Kata containers. Now, so, uh, We'll do some performance testing and, and I'll let you know. Supposedly containers are allegedly 30% more uh, performant than virtual machines. But uh, again, I think that's probably a lot based on the application that you're running. Uh, one thing I will tell you that I know from experience is that virtual machines work a lot better with, uh, with uh, 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 state machine based applications. Uh, they they're just hands down better performers on, on that architecture than they are on containers. Uh, containers are great for most everything else, and they're 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 good for monolithic. Uh, I don't I don't touch anything with uh, uh, messaging architectures because it's very hard to just for one reason. You, you're moving all your messages through your port through a single port on your firewall, and so that firewall is open for everything. It's very hard to uh, especially when things are encrypted you can't see the messages inside so you don't know what's coming that's bad <laughs> and so that's one of the reasons why I don't like uh, microservices or even any kind of messaging architectures is it, is, is it just blows giant holes in your security so enough of my complaining and 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 and, and my get off my lawn speech uh, but I'll let you know how that goes in a future uh, in a future video uh, and, uh, and the next time I get back with you, I'll show you uh, what I know about Docker. We'll, we'll install it, we'll build an app, and then uh, we'll, uh, we'll deploy it and we'll run it and uh, show you how you can monitor it. So we'll do that next time. Hope to see you again real soon and uh, uh, take care and bye for now. Mm -hmm.